everyone. God bless you. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, Brian, it's good to have you back. Uh, some of y'all didn't know Brian was away from me for a week, but uh, I, I let him escape from me for a week, and God brought him back. So we're grateful to have him back. Grateful to see each and every one of you here in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, I love the fact that we have started off this year talking about prayer, and today we want to talk about um, the Word of God, and um, if I were to break down what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and therefore a child of God, I could say that it means that we collectively, collectively we hear from God, we talk to God, and we encourage one another with the Word of God, and so today we want to talk about hearing from God uh, through the Bible, through the scriptures, and also about encouraging one another from the Bible, which is the Word of God. And some of you uh, may have had parents or parental influences in your lives who made sure you attended Sunday school. Anybody remember Sunday school? All right, Sunday school, blessed school, rain or shine, be on time. Yes, we had a theme song. And um, that's where many of us would learn the Bible from a very young age who we were committed or encouraged to commit the Bible to memory. Anybody remember memory verses? Some of you remember memory verses. When I was about eight years old, my Sunday school gave a class in which we were so supposed to remember uh, you know, a chunk of scripture. I believe it was the 150th Psalm. And if we were able to do that, there was a prize. And the prize was a French fry dinner. <laughs> I have no idea why that motivated me. A French fry dinner. <laughs> but I learned that Psalm, and I mean, I, I, I remember that French fry dinner to this day. Uh, of course, that was only a temporary reward, but reading the Bible has a much greater reward than that. It can shape you into a person who is completely equipped for life. And there was a young man in the Bible that we learn about named Timothy who, al who also began to learn the scriptures from a very young age. He was a protege of Paul the apostle, meaning that he was under the care and the training of Paul, and Paul was teaching him about life in general, and he was also teaching and training him and preparing him for a life of service as, uh, to the church as a leader and also as a minister of the gospel. And Paul wrote two letters to Timothy uh, that are recorded for us in the New Testament of the Bible, and we're going to look today at the second letter that he wrote. Uh, for our instruction in the Word of God. And this second letter of Paul to Timothy is quite la likely the last letter that Paul ever wrote. Because when Paul wrote this letter, he was sitting in a Roman jail. He was enduring his second Roman imprisonment, and he knew he was at the end of his life, not because he was going to die a natural death, but because the opponents to the gospel of Jesus Christ would most likely take his life. And so we know this because at the end of this letter, he tells Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7, he ends up saying, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and at the time of my departure has come. And this is where he says uh, what for some of us are famous words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course or finished the race, and I have kept the faith. These are the sentiments. These are the emotions that Paul is writing to Timothy uh, with. And uh, I would say that this would be a significant letter of importance in Timothy's life. And Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't really have time to in this short letter. He's straightforward. And he's to the point about the most important things in life that Timothy needs to focus on. So if you would turn with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
verses 14 through 17. If you've got a copy of the Bible, uh, if you'd like a, a, an actual tactile copy, they're underneath uh, the, the, the seat in front of you. We'll also have it here on the screen. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. Here's what Paul writes to Timothy. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it, or I'm sorry, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So just for a few minutes, I want to speak to us about how the Bible equips us for life, how the Bible equips us for life. And it does that at least uh, through this text, from this text in three ways, through the encouragement of godly people, uh, through learning and believing the Bible, and through applying what we've learned to all of life. Very simple outline. Number one, through the encouragement of godly people. Read it again from verses 14 and 15, but as for you, Paul writes, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So Paul says to continue. Everybody say continue. There is a depth to that word that goes be beyond just keep going. It's calling for more than just repeating the words or mechanically performing the actions. It's calling Timothy to, uh, to, and it's calling us to keep his commitment to abide in, to spend time in the word of God and consider its implications to his life and then to live out what the word of God teaches and promises. It's one thing to say, the Word of God has no relevance in my life. Anybody have any friends or family that might say that? Maybe you said that at one point in your life. The Word of God is not relevant to me, but you only peripherally know one or two Scripture texts. And the ones that you do know, you're taking out of context. If you don't really know the Word of God and you've never really taken the time to really commit to it and apply it to your life, because it's another thing entirely to continue in what you have learned, but you have to learn it first. So Paul also says you firmly believed. He says the, the, the word that translate this phrase you firmly believed is the same as the word for faith. But Timothy doesn't have blind faith about the word of God. He's learned the word of God. He's proved the word of God. The phrase doesn't mean that Timothy doesn't come to the Word of God with some questions, but as he continues in the Word of God, as he goes to the godly people in his life, his faith, his faith in God through the Word of God is strengthened. Reading and memorizing and meditating on the Word of God has it's got so many benefits to our lives, more important than even the physical benefits that we have from uh, receiving good nutrition or good exercise or uh, even good mindfulness techniques. But Paul is pointing out that those benefits are not realized automatically. We've got to continue and firmly believe. You might question, yes, but continue in it and firmly believe. We receive the answers from the Word of God, and from the godly influences that we have. We hold on to it, and it changes and it transforms our lives. So godly people, godly influences. There were at least three main influences in Timothy's life. Paul mentions uh, the first two in the first chapter or chapter one of 2 Timothy, 
in chapter 1, verse 5, same, same, part, same letter here, he's saying, I am reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So as a young man in the culture that Timothy grew up in, he would have learned about the scriptures at school, starting as early as about five years old. However, Paul doesn't really just mention his educational upbringing here. He mentions two ladies who were instrumental in helping to shape this young man for life and for a lifetime of ministry. Timothy has demonstrated a sincere faith, and much like everything in life, and certainly in the Christian life, he's not giving Timothy all the credit for that. How many of you know that if you're going to become anything in your, this life, you're not going to do it by yourself? Amen? So we know that our faith comes to us as a gift of God so that we might believe in Jesus and receive salvation. But Paul points out that there's a sincere faith that Timothy has and that he's displayed and shown. It was first cultivated in his grandmother Lois. And it was passed on from his grandmother Lois to his mother Eunice. And his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice then passed it on to him. How? Through their lives, through their words, through their teaching, through their correction, through their encouragement, all with the Word of God as their foundation. So from childhood, they, along with any teachers that he had, acquainted him with the sacred writings, and it helped to shape his life. And then later now, Paul comes into his life as a mentor as a friend, as an instructor. And as you read through this letter and even uh, through the, the first letter that he wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy, you realize that Paul is not just a buddy. Paul's not just one of his boys. He takes very seriously the task of being a mentor and being a friend and being an encourager, even being a confronter. But he also takes seriously the task of being an example. Listen to what he writes, Timothy, in verse 10 of this same chapter. In verse 10, right above where our text is, he writes this, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people, impostors, will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But in verse 10 and 11, there are eight mys that Timothy has followed in Paul's life. Timothy, I've watched you follow my teaching from the Word of God, my conduct, you've watched the way that I live, my aim in life, you've seen what my purpose is and what my life has been all about since I've been saved, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness or, or my endurance, and also my persecutions and sufferings. And the truth is, everyone who lives godly in Christ is going to experience that. So... It's a lot of mys. My, 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 my. And Paul is not just being egotistical there. What he is doing is taking very seriously the task of discipling someone that God has put into his care, very intentionally. Paul says, Timothy, as for you, I don't know about anybody else, but you, you've been mentored by me, and my life has been built on the word of God. And even though my life has been built on the Word of God, it doesn't mean that I haven't experienced challenges and suffering. I need you, though, to continue in what you have learned from me. And this is not a call to blind loyalty uh, to Paul from Timothy. He's actually asking Timothy to be incredibly discerning. Know who you learned it from. 
Compare it to the sacred writings. The sacred writings are also able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And the scriptures give you the wisdom that points you to Christ and causes your faith to grow. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1.11, Paul tells all of those in the, the, uh, uh, the church in Corinth and all of us as well. He says, follow me as what? As I follow Christ. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And and the question I have to ask for us today is who and what are we allowing to influence us? And then also, how are we influencing our generation and the next generation? Are we intentionally with commitment and with faith? Allowing the Word of God to shape our lives so that we can influence our generation and influence the next generation. Who who are the major godly, righteous influences in your life? Who are the major influences in your life for righteousness? What we see here with Timothy and Paul And Timothy and his his mother and his grandmother, it's a beautiful example of how a person can be shaped in life to really, really do some good, to be equipped and to be prepared for the ups and downs of life, for the challenges, for the disappointments, for the successes, for the victories. And I know that there are plenty of people who can make a tremendous impact in life, even though uh, they've been through trauma and they've been through some very challenging times and they don't necessarily have all of the mentors around them and people around them, but uh, and, and some of you may be here today, you've been able to do some good, but for each and every one of us in here today, from this day, our aim and our goal should not only be to allow trauma and challenge to be our only teachers. God has given us a grace so that we can give grace to others, so that we can be an influence for good, an influence for righteousness, for someone in the next generation. Amen? And whatever age you are right now, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you should always be seeking to be influenced by a godly person, by a person who loves righteousness, who loves Jesus, who loves God's people, who loves the world like God did by bringing Jesus into the world to see the world saved and who wants to influence you to give glory to God in everything you do and say. And not only, if, if, if you've not found that person, I want to ask, are you that person for somebody? So I want to encourage us as, as a church, Riverside, our mission is to help all people know Christ and grow in Christ. That cannot be done from this pulpit alone. Amen? Amen. It's not done on Sunday morning alone. Grandmothers, mothers, grandfathers, fathers, uncles, older brothers, older sisters, maybe not related in any physical way, but related by the blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ that are here today, older men, live an exemplary life before our younger younger men and actively share that life with them. Older women, live an exemplary life and actively share that with the younger women. They don't need to know all the dirt of your past, okay? But they do need to know that somehow, yes, you were a sinner and God saved you and brought you through all right, amen? Amen. And we can share that, and it's important that we do. This is why we uh, create intentional smaller groups in this church. Today's Connect Sunday. We're going to be looking at life groups and community groups and learning groups and try it. And I I just want to say, please, by the grace of God, be a great influence on someone else. It's biblical. We're a church that preaches that the gospel is not dependent on our works. We know that. And we preach that according to Scripture alone. We're saved by God's grace alone, through faith 
alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. But as we live the Christian life, how many of y'all know we're not alone? We need one another. Amen? We're a part of the body of Christ. We influence one another. We edify one another. Uh, We learn to love one another. We confess our faults to one another. We forgive one another. We lead one another. We allow one another to enjoy the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Y'all thought I missed it, right? And then we point one another to Christ. Amen? So not only through the encouragement of godly people, but also through learning and believing the Bible, Timothy also learned that the foundation for all things in the Christian life, including the influences that he has in his life, is the Bible. Verse 15, he says, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture is breathed out by God. From childhood, he's taught the scriptures as far back as he can remember. And sometimes there's people that that say, man, I wish I was raised in the church like you were. And, And honestly, it's a blessing to be raised in a family or a culture where learning the scriptures from an early age is possible. But I want to stress it's more important for you and for the people that you will influence later that you allow the Bible to be in major influence right now. If you don't have a past where you grew up in church, let's say that, you know, I am however many years old at this point in time, and, and I was raised in the church from the time I can remember. And maybe you just, maybe this is your second week where you have confessed your faith in God. Well, guess what? You're two weeks old. You're still young. Amen? You're still young. You're just young in the Lord. So allow whatever time you have been a part of the body of Christ, dig into the Word of God, find godly influences, and begin to learn the Word of God so that it may shape your life. When you come to faith in Christ, get started. If you know you put your faith in Christ some time ago, but you really haven't followed him faithfully in having your life shaped by his words, can I just encourage you, get started again. Get started again. There's no time to say pause by the side of the road because we've got a race to run. There's no time to, to, for you to stay wallowing in shame and guilt because you've got a fight to fight and the Lord is with you. So be encouraged. Get into the word of God. Learn what you can. Allow it to begin to shape your life, no matter how old you are or how long you've been in the church. Timothy was influenced by these sacred writings. What were the sacred writings that he was acquainted with? It was the Old Testament scriptures. You all remember the Old Testament. We don't often sometimes preach or talk about the uh, Old Testament. Some of us are unfamiliar with the Old Testament scriptures. Did you know that that is all that Timothy had? All he had was the Old Testament scriptures. And as a matter of fact, there are some who believe that the Old Testament scriptures are unnecessary for New Testament saints. Might say, well, man, in, don't, don't we just need the Gospels and, and the letters and the Revelation? And it's only there that we see Jesus. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Paul says that these sacred writings, these Old Testament scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. Because the Old Testament scriptures, like all of scripture, ultimately is to point you to Jesus Christ. It's to point us to a Savior who brings salvation and eternal life to those who put their faith in and their trust in him. The Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures, they're not just an end in of themselves. They are to point you to Christ. And why do I say that? Well, because there's plenty of people who know a lot about the scriptures and their lives have never been changed. There's plenty of people who uh, uh, know a lot of scripture. They can quote a lot of scripture, but they're just mean and they're unforgiving. 
and they exhibit no fruit of the Spirit. Because it's important not just to read the Scripture as it is on your page, but allow the Scripture to get into you and to provide the transforming power that is needed to move us from being those who only depend on ourselves to being those who depend fully and completely on God. The Scriptures lead to salvation, but only as they point to Christ. And so, uh, the Bible equips us for life through the encouragement of godly people, through learning and believing the Bible, and finally, through applying what we've learned, through applying what we've learned from the Bible and also from those who have been transformed by the Word of God, who are influencing our lives. Last text, 16 and 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul says the Word of God is profitable. Profitable. It's beneficial. It's promoting or enhancing well-being. Question for all of us. Can we think of anything that is more beneficial to us than the Word of God? I would, I would argue that most of us would say there's nothing more beneficial than the Word of God for every aspect of our life. Not education, right? Not career advice, not relationship advice, not stock tips. And, and without at all trying to add any guilt, it's just a question of examination for me and for all of us. We need to find out what is really, if, if that is true, What really is the major influence and what are the major influences in our lives for for the mindset that we have, for our worldview, for our decisions, for our reactions? Is it the Word of God that Paul says prepares the man or woman of God, the child of God, the servant of God, to be complete and to be equipped for every good work? Is that the major influence in our life? Or or is the major influence in our lives with regards to like how we think and how we react and and, and what is like, what what triggers us? Is it what we've watched on YouTube? Is it what we've watched on TikTok? Is it reels? Now, I'm saying this because, listen, I know that for many of us, you get your news from these places. You get your, it, it, these things influence us. Am I, am I on the, the only one? I'm not the only one, right? These things influence us. And the question to ask is, are they the major influence in our life? Or is it the Word of God? Is it CNN? Is it Fox News? Is it comedians? Is it philosophies uh, from books or from material or people or articles who claim to be Christian, but they actually are competing with the Word of God and going against the influence of the Word of God in your life? Paul says that if you want to be equipped for every good work and complete in this life while being prepared and made ready for eternal life, I'm I'm not saying you have to read the Bible as a qualification for eternal life. That's only coming through faith in Jesus Christ. But becoming like Jesus in our character and in our lifestyle and the way that we encounter this world and treat other people, you need the Word of God. We need the Bible. And it's profitable, Paul says, for teaching, for correcting, for reproof, for training. This is how the Word of God equips us for all of life. Teaching. The Bible tells us who God is who we are, what is our place in this world, what God desires for us, how we ought to live this life to the glory of God. The Bible tells the story of creation, the fall, a redemption through Jesus Christ, the restoration of all things when Jesus returns. The Bible is, never claims to be a science book, but it's not a fiction book. It's not a documentary, but it's not just a commentary on life. 
Reading it and meditating on it and applying it to our lives is essential for a believer of God, a believer of the God of the Bible, and for a follower of Jesus Christ. Because the goal of teaching is learning, right? Goal of teaching is learning. Goal of teaching from the scriptures is learning about the nature of God, learning about the character of God, and ultimately the salvation that's available through Jesus Christ. So if you learn scripture, especially from trusted people whom you know. Remember, Paul says, man, you've seen my way of life, right? You've seen my way of life. I, I, I would want to say that uh, maybe, maybe there is someone here who has been entrusting their lives or trust, entrusting themselves uh, to, to YouTube teachers and preachers that you know nothing about. You know nothing about their lives. You know nothing about how they influence you. And the people who are right around you, who you know their lives, and they know your lives, are saying, would you look at the Word of God from this perspective? I think that's important, to know their lives. It protects us. It protects us uh, from heresy. It protects us from wrong interpretations of the Word of God. Teaching, teaching tells us who the Bible is. And then reproof. Reproof, that's a word that we don't use often anymore. There's also a word that's very similar. Another translation will use this word, rebuke. That just sounds bad, right? Rebuke. And uh, it it means to expose errors. It means to, to even criticize, to make a critical judgment about somebody. Well, Scripture can show sinners their failures. It can clarify the point of the mistake. It can lead us to a new sense of peace and wholeness. Listen, I don't know if any one of us here likes to hear a rebuke. Most of us don't like to hear somebody say, you did that wrong. You said that wrong, which is why most of us don't do it anymore. We just leave people alone. Okay, well, I guess that's their truth and they're just going to live it, right? We just leave people alone. I would say, though, that the Word of God loves us too much to allow us to do that. Word of God does, doesn't just, just look at us and say, hey, it's your truth, you do you. You don't do that with people you love, right? If I have a 16-year-old son, I don't just look at him and say, hey, 16-year-old Johnny who just learned to drive and, and you are actually the most expensive thing in the world as far as car insurance is concerned. Speed limit is is 55, but it's your truth. You do you. It's all good. No, if you're, listen, if you're riding in the car and they do like one mile above 65, you're like, no, 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 you need to, you need to slow down and drive safe. And they look at you and they're like, but you do this all the time. They're like, no, 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 no. (laughs) This is one time where you, you do what I say and not what I do. You love them too much, they need to be trained, so they're going to have to be reproved at that point. But what comes after that is correction. Correction, once the reproof is clear, the Word of God offers what you need to improve or to correct a mistake or to avoid a mistake in the future. The Bible offers the right thing to do. It's often going to bring conviction, and sometimes it happens through even discipline. If you have a coach, if you're an athlete, the coach is going to correct your stance. They're going to correct your posture. They're going to correct your habits in order for you as an athlete to be able to operate, to run, to jump, to shoot more efficiently and effectively. And Scripture helps individuals to restore uh, their doctrine to the, to the, in the right way or their personal practices to a state before God. Uh, correction is one means that God uses in order to restore people to spiritual positions that they may have forfeited. It's like when you have your GPS in your car. When you're going in, the, you've set the destination and you're going uh, in the direction and 
you veer off of the direction that the GPS has set you on. What does it say? Rerouting. Rerouting. Well, when it says that to you, the GPS is not mad at you. The GPS is not, is, is not yelling at you. You're going the wrong way. So the GPS is only there to correct you and, and find a way to get you back on the right path. The Word of God is there for correction. Word of God is finally there for training, discipline, training. Uh, that word originally is talking about the rearing of children or the education of children and training in righteousness, it's going to be a, a system or a discipline, an education in the Scripture that leads to a holy, righteous, Christ-centered worldview and life. Often when we hear this training in righteousness, you're like, man, that's, that's just so boring, especially when you're, you're young. It's like, man, that's, that's just so boring. Righteousness is so, so, so boring, but righteousness doesn't mean going to church every day. It doesn't mean spending 20 hours in prayer or reading the Bible all day long. Righteousness is right living with an emphasis on an identity that is based in God, with activities of justice and peace and love in the world, seeing the gospel infiltrate every aspect of our lives completely until the glory of God is what really guides and directs all of our steps, that our desire is to see the glory of God in our lives, in our jobs, in our parenting, in our marriages, in every relationship. Uh, when we play, whatever we do until the glory of God fills the world like the waters cover the sea. That is what righteousness is. God seeks to make you righteous, to conform you to the image of Christ so that you would be blessed. When Jesus came, he gave a new law. He started to talk about in, in the, the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are you, happy are you. And all of those things that he talks about are things that are in the way of righteousness. So the Word of God is there. It's there that the man of God, that the child of God, may be complete and equipped for every good work. Otherwise, thoroughly equipped for every good word. It means that the child of God is completely prepared for whatever God has called him to do. That the child of God is... She's not perfect, uh, she's not yet out of training, but she has the tools and she's learned how to use them to the glory of God. That word equip suggests that it's an abiding condition. If, if Timothy would, if we would nurture our spiritual life in the scriptures for every aspect of our lives, not just church ministry, but in everything that you do and say, we're going to be fully qualified and we're going to be prepared to undertake whatever task God allows to come before us. Amen? So the Bible equips us for this life through the encouragement of godly people. And I want to encourage each and every one of us here today. God is desiring to shape your life from the Word of God to be a tremendous influence in the life of someone else. I just want you to think for a moment about those people in your life, maybe the young people who you have some access to or the young people that you have very close access to because they came from you. They're a part of your family, right? And also just think about who's actually influencing me? Who, who have I allowed into my life in order to speak into my life? Maybe there's a small group. Maybe there's a, a way that you can be a part of a life group if you haven't done that already in order to, with us here, this body of believers that God has brought to, together in North Lauderdale, ensure that that happens in your life through learning and believing the scriptures. God is calling us. God is calling us without it being legalistic to understand how learning and trusting the Word of God shapes our lives, and then through applying what we've learned to all of life. 
through the teaching of the word of God, through the reproof it gives, through the correction it gives, and through its training. May God just continue to help each and every one of us to fall in love with his word, to apply it to our lives, and to to influence each other for the good that he has equipped us to do. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we thank you. We honor you for your word. It's a light to our path. It's a lamp for our feet. And we trust you, God, that as you have given us your word, that you would also give us the strength, even through this encouragement today, to faithfully live by it and trust you for it. Trust you, Lord, that every aspect of our lives, every decision that we make, uh, you're, you're giving us the training and the correction and the teaching to know how to do it through your word and through the people that you have placed around us. Thank you for this beautiful body of believers that you have brought together as Riverside Church. Continue to bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.